On this edition of Native Report, we head into the kitchen to bake a batch of Three Sisters cookies with Tashia Hart. We'll learn about an Ojibwe language and culture podcast that features Native American puppets. And we'll learn about one Native nation's plans to be energy independent by the year 2020. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. Tashia Hart is a culinary ethnobotanist and is an expert in identifying wild and indigenous plants. Co-host Rita Aspinwall joins Tashia on our kitchen set to help bake a batch of Three Sisters cookies. Today we have Tashia Hart, indigenous food advocate. Tashia, what, is, what would you consider is an indigenous food advocate? So indigenous food advocate, I try and bridge the gap between the environment, uh, plants, animals, and then people. And food is really, I think, the best way to do that, so. Awesome. So what are we baking today? We're gonna make a Three Sisters cookie. Um, it has a foundation of seed butter that's made with sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, maple syrup, honey, um, a little bit, bit of this awesome Hawaiian salt that a friend uh, gave me, and then we're gonna have some squash puree, um, and then also some beans and um, some corn flour. And then we're gonna top it with some more pumpkin seeds, some maple syrup, um, a fruit sauce, and some assor assortment of dried berries. First, we're gonna start by uh, cutting this squash here. This is a butternut squash. You know, um, we're finding more and more uh, varieties of uh, native foods in the like, you know, little grocery stores and health food stores all over Minnesota, and that's really, that's really exciting to me to like be able to go in there and like see these foods that like, you know, just like brings me to the places where they grow in the wild, and it's like connected to memories. Awesome. All right. So since we have that all chopped up, what do we do next? So now we're just gonna put toss in about two tablespoons of sunflower oil. That looks good, and I'll let you give it a pinch of salt. A little more? A little bit more. Thank you. And just gonna pour in a little bit of maple syrup, about a tablespoon. It's really peaceful for me and calming to sort of really get my hands kind of in there. Okay. Uh, kind of, do you want me to? Yeah, if you want to spread bit? it around there, I'm just gonna get this. So now we're just gonna pop this into the oven. It's at 400 degrees and it's gonna take about, about 30 minutes, but we're gonna keep an eye on it. We're gonna let it get kind of like nice and brown. Um, and if there's like a little bit of blackening on a few of the pieces, that's actually, I love that, because it'll, it'll taste nice and roasted. Um, I'll open this for you. So the next thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna get our pumpkin seeds in the oven. Okay. Because we're gonna need that for our seed butter. So I like that. Nice. that. Um, these are raw pumpkin seeds, um, so we're just going to put and we like to kind of spread them out, but this is this is this is going to work great too because we can kind of um, we can kind of stir them up a little bit after a couple of minutes and then let the let the ones that are on the bottom kind of come up and get roasted too. Cool. And is this going in the same oven as the squash or yeah, yeah. we can uh, we can stick it right in the 400 degree oven. And you don't, um, you don't have to put it, you can put it at like 350 or 325, but if you're gonna put it at 400, you just gotta check it after a couple minutes and make sure that it's, um, this, they're not burning. The squash is roasting, the pumpkin seeds are cooking. What's the next step? Uh, the next step is we're gonna get set up to make our seed butter. All right. So how long do you let this 
go on for? Um, it's going to take a couple minutes. Uh, as the seeds break down, um, it'll start sticking to the side, and then we'll have to turn it off and kind of scrape it a little bit and then okay. um, let it go again. Okay. Mmm. Yum. So this okay. is about four cups of seed butter that we just made, um, and we're going to go ahead and put that into, we can just put it right back into the bowl that we mixed our squash in. All right, so the squash has been cooking for about 30 minutes and there are parts of the squash that are getting a little brown and that's what we were kind of going for. And you can see on some of these pieces on the bottom, they have some caramelization going with the maple syrup and the honey mm -hmm. and the salt and just the natural um, sugars from the squash. That's gonna be really good. Now we are gonna mix um, our batter. So what is first? So first we're gonna take a, a cup of this beautiful squash that we roasted. And we're also gonna add a, a cup of these uh, navy beans. And then we're gonna add a little bit of honey, some maple syrup, a little bit of salt, um, just a little bit of oil. All right. And then um, we can do about a quarter cup of maple syrup. So the cookie um, is actually gluten-free. There's no dairy or eggs. Um, there's no, you know, there's no wheat or uh, tree nuts, so it's free of a lot of allergens for a lot of people. Let's put in a little bit about a tablespoon of oil. And I think we'll do about a half a teaspoon of salt. We can add some of the cornmeal. For the viewers that are going to make this, how will they know how much cornmeal is enough? Um, well, you want the batter to feel a little bit wetter than peanut butter. What is the next step? So we're going to put about a half a cup of dried cranberries in. Uh, we can just put this, put this to the side for mm -hmm. a second. We can grab our pan. And we're going to do about rounded, uh, about a rounded tablespoon. You can make them whatever size you want. You could even like spread this across the whole thing, bake that, and then cut it. And then after we get them all on there, then we're gonna kind of flatten them down a little bit, and pop some seeds and a little bit of oil and maple syrup on top, and then put them in the oven. And the cookies, uh, this batter, they're not gonna sink down. So what we want to do is we kind we do we do kind of want to shape them. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of our roasted pumpkin seeds. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna put a few on top. So these are ready to go in the oven. Awesome. So I think we're we're ready to dress the cookies. So it's kind of like a cookie buffet. You decorate it how you want. Um, so what are you going to put on yours? Maybe we can start with some of this fruit uh, fruit tramp that had raspberries and strawberries and elderberries and I think I'll do some too. Queens of a little bit of amaranth. Let's see how it tastes. Mmm, so good. Mm. It is really delicious. Mm. Mm. Well, that was a lot of fun. And it's nutritious, it's egg-free, gluten-free. Um, I want to thank you for coming and joining us on Native Report. This is super delicious, and if you want to check out the recipe, come to nativereport.org and uh, try it at home. When someone has kidney failure, it means they have about 15% of their kidney function left. We talked about GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, on an earlier segment of Health Matters, and kidney failure is defined as a GFR of less than 15, and this is when dialysis is started. Dialysis is meant to do the job healthy kidneys take care of, and this means filtering waste products out of our blood and removing excess fluid. The main things removed from blood during dialysis are electrolytes, mainly sodium, potassium, phosphorus, and bicarbonate. Dialysis removes excess salt and extra fluid and helps control blood pressure. Dialysis is sometimes done for short-term kidney failure that is expected to get better, but most of the time the kidney failure is permanent and dialysis is lifelong. If you're a good candidate for a kidney transplant, you can be put on a waiting list for a new kidney. 
These are difficult to come by and not enough people are organ donors. There are two main types of dialysis and these are hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis uses a machine called a hemodialyzer to remove wastes and chemicals and excess fluid from your blood. To get blood to go into the machine, a special access has to be made. Sometimes this is a plastic tube that is placed in a large vein in the neck for a relatively short time, but most of the time a permanent access is made. This is most often done by joining an artery and a vein under the skin to make a bigger blood vessel called a fistula. This fistula is only for dialysis and cannot be used for blood draws, and blood pressure should not be checked on that side if the fistula is in an arm. Dialysis treatments last about four hours, three times a week, and the length of time depends on how well your kidneys work, how much fluid is to be removed, how big you are, how much waste has to be removed, and the type of machine used. The other type of dialysis is called peritoneal dialysis, and it uses the membrane lining the abdominal wall, or peritoneal cavity, to filter out fluid and wastes. There are two kinds of peritoneal dialysis, and these are continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, or CAPD, and automated peritoneal dialysis, or APD. Continuous ambulatory dialysis is the only dialysis done without machines, and you do this yourself four or five times a day. This consists of having a catheter that goes into your peritoneal cavity and using that catheter to put a bag of about two quarts of dialysis into your peritoneal cavity and it stays there for about four or five hours before it is drained back into the bag and thrown away. While the dialysis is in your peritoneal cavity, you can go about your regular activities at home, work, or school. Automated peritoneal dialysis, or APD, is done at home using a special machine called a cycler. This is like CAPD, except that a number of cycles or exchanges occur. These exchanges are done throughout the night while you sleep. Dialysis has been around since the 1940s and has been a regular treatment for kidney failure since the 1960s. Dialysis costs a lot of money and the federal government has paid about 80% of that cost over the years. Dialysis will not cure kidney failure and the treatments are usually lifelong. The average life expectancy for someone on dialysis is 5 to 10 years, but many patients have lived well on dialysis for 20 or even 30 years. The key point is one we've seen again and again, and this is prevention. Take advantage of free screenings at community health fairs and make sure the numbers are explained to you. Make sure you have regular visits to discuss prevention with your health care provider. Keep your diabetes in control, exercise regularly, eat a sensible diet, be proactive about your blood pressure, and take your medicines as prescribed. And don't forget to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and this is Health Matters. Michael Lyons is an accomplished illustrator and author, but has recently developed a video podcast devoted to Ojibwe language and culture. And while there may be several such podcasts or similar online web-based tutorials for people to choose from, what makes Michael's efforts stand out is his use of puppets, music, and humor to help others learn and keep a language alive. Okay, bend again. Bonjour, ni jalashinabe dog. Nana Bujo and Dijana Kaz. Bujo Nana Bujo started about six months ago. I'd been sort of thinking about it. I said, wouldn't it be cool to have something that was sort of a cross between Sesame Street and like the movie Smoke Signals? Michael Lyons is an accomplished illustrator and author, but lately he has ventured into a new creative medium with a video podcast that incorporates the Ojibwe language. His program is titled Buju Nana Buju. For years I've been doing a character that sounds kind of like Thomas from Smoke Signals. You know, remember, uh, hey Victor, where's your dad? Well, that kind of became Nana Buju. So that first one, he was teaching uh, coffee. It was all about, uh, you know, the response online had, you know, the bar is so low. They, everyone loved it. My second one was called um, Niwi Saga Am. I need to go to the bathroom. And he basically comes out and goes, okay, let's make this really short. I got to go to the bathroom. Niwi Saga Am. And he just kind of bounces around. And he goes, and like within a day, there are 3,000 hits for that thing. I was like, what? There's well, basically no, kind of three main areas that Nana Buju covers. Started, you know, One is an Ojibwe you know, word of the day. Nana Buju also uh, tells Ojibwe stories. So like uh, this morning I did one where he tells the story of how Beaver got his tail. And then the third area that we sort of do is um, like a music video. All right, let's try this. 
<clears throat> Why don't you get a close up on my hands? But then it's just sort of following kind of children's show format. Okay, and so the podcast will have him. The word of the day might be coffee, you know, and then he'll break for a song. And the song really has nothing to do with Ojibwe necessarily. But, uh, and uh, then he may tell a story, you know, an oral tradition story and say goodbye. Michael has toyed with a longer format for the podcast, but has found that a shorter production holds the attention of the viewer. For a show that might run 10 minutes, there is at least several hours of production time put into it. I could do a podcast in half an hour, but I love to tweak it now, and I've been exploring special effects and stuff like that. So now I can play around with a podcast for three or four hours and then end up with 10 minutes worth of actual footage. I already had a little bit of an audience on Facebook um, from the Ojibberish comic strip. So I knew there were probably around 200 people who would at least be familiar with the concept of me putting something creative out that had to do with the Ojibwe language. Um, but I was also a big fan of podcasts just on YouTube. The whole thing is produced just on a movie maker download and uh, a pretty inexpensive camera. As the months have gone by, new cast of characters have come on. Um, you know, there's a dog, a stuffed dog that has been the engineer. And uh, during one episode, we learned that uh, his name is Anamush. They all have like Ojibwe names. I wanted to create something, you know, just my sensibilities as an artist is sort of uh, cartoons, cartoonish stuff, you know, something kids like. But um, uh, teaching the, the language, you know, gives me a, a vehicle to create these characters and these scenes and use music and. I want to make something that's uh, entertaining um, and engaging and maybe inspiring kids to learn it on their own. And the use of modern technology might be the right tools to spur their interests. I just got interviewed last week from a magazine here in Bemidji and they asked Tony Troyer about that. He's a language I know. And uh, he was very nice about it. He says, oh, uh, Michael's show is very innovative. But then, of course, it has to be. Um, he was saying that uh, all of our language stuff needs to keep up with uh, the times, especially if anything we're trying to impart to the younger generation. Um, you know, all the kids I work with, and you know, a lot of them don't come from money at all, but they all have a phone. So I think it's great to use modern technology to um, talk about traditional stuff. And um, also, you know, sometimes I think uh, language revitalization efforts can suffer from too much, like, well, we have to do this in the traditional way. In, in fact, I'm still learning. I, I, I probably present myself as a fluent speaker, but mostly, you know, I'm learning as I'm creating. Okay, have a good night. I'll see ya. People see us, but they don't talk to us. I think it's time that we put that wall down and start to interact with one another as a people and know what's aware of what's going on with each other as Native people and other people. And as this morning, one guy has said, what, is, what question can I ask that I, I am not going to offend you? I said, my grandmother, Annie Gijic, said to me, there are no dumb questions. <laughs> and we all laughed and that was it. That was simple native humor um, and um, what do you call that, uh, psychology. You know, that my grandma said, you know, there are no dumb questions. And it was real simple and it was honest and it was right to the point. Mm -hmm. And that's what I liked. And that's how I, was, I grew up in the Nut Lake. Red Lake Nation leaders have a vision to help all their people live in harmony with nature with the installation of a 15 megawatt rooftop solar panel array. This is a phase one of a three-phase project and is one of the largest solar projects planned in northern Minnesota. 
Tribal leaders see this as a big step towards energy independence for their nation. Join us now as we learn about this ambitious project. Friday, March 23rd, 2018 marked a new day for the Red Lake Nation with the delivery and installation of solar panels and other related equipment at the Red Lake Tribal Government Center. This is the first phase of the nation's solar energy project. The idea and the impetus behind the whole project was Chairman Siki. Chairman Siki approached me to talk about solar energy and what we could do, what we as at Red Lake could do with regard to solar energy. So we started talking and we talked about you know, the implementation of various aspects of it. So I said, okay, I'll run with it. We went with it. We got the total support and endorsement from the full tribal council and, and to move the project, project forward. And the whole project was based on, on the concepts and the initiatives of preservation and, and conservation of our environment. Because let's face it, who, that's, that's, our, that's who we are as Native people. The second thing is we wanted to provide an a energy source, <clears throat> which is it's comparable, an energy source comparable with our tribal beliefs and who we are and live in harmony with Mother Earth. I mean, what better cause than that? And what more, what better uh, uh, motivation for us to move this project forward than, than, than that, right? And not only that, but then you get into the whole job development labor force development. I mean, you get into the, the quality of life, uh, training of our labor force, employment, jobs, diversification of our economy. During the second phase, the Red Lake Nation will develop solar energy farms, a 40 to 100 acre area of solar panels. In phase three, it will develop a solar energy storage plant. Phase one consists of providing solar energy solar energy and equipment installation and providing electricity to our major, to our larger tribal community facilities. We'll do three casinos, all the schools, the tribal government center, the Red Lake Nation College, and I think we're also doing the, all the schools, the Justice Center, uh, Justice Center Complex. Phase two, is we move, move ahead with, uh, and we're working on that currently too, simultaneously, uh, uh, 50 to 100 acre, 100 acre solar farm that'll generate about, oh, anywhere from 12 to 18 megawatts of electricity. In phase three is we'll be adding another, maybe one or two solar farm, 100 acre solar farms, with the capacity and the capability of hopefully providing electricity for all our tribal members within the boundaries. Included in all phases is the training of our people to work as workers and, and not only just as, as laborers, which so many times happens when, when, when uh, projects are brought onto our lands, the fact that our, guy, our, our people just get the menial jobs. No, we're gonna, we're gonna there, we've got a, this, this uh, solar energy company, Innovative Power Systems, out of uh, St. Paul is committed to training our members in all aspects of solar energy. So we're pretty excited about that also. The total cost for the project is an estimated $60 million, and the nation hopes to have the project complete by 2020. However, Red Lake will start saving an estimated $2 million per year in energy costs. The one last detail to take care of is what to do with the excess energy that is generated. Phase. 1A, I like to call it, because it's still within phase one, is then, after we get the solar units on the roofs for those, these facilities, we'll move ahead with 1A, which is storage. What we found out as we got into this project in meeting with the local, local utility companies, the co-ops, well, they would not purchase that excess electricity from us, so there we were, we're caught with a dilemma. On the East Coast and the West Coast, Solar, solar energy storage is a big deal. I mean, it's, they're doing it. The Midwest, and I don't know, I never realized this until I started working on these projects, is that the Midwest is always lacking in the technology side of most, most projects. And so we'll be like one of the first, one of the first uh, in the Midwest to use energy, uh, the energy storage on our, on our sites. I think it also shows that, that what a tribe is capable of doing if they're committed to doing something. You know, if we're committed to go out, think outside the box and be proactive and really 
do the due diligence and, and take the time to really develop, find a good partner, develop a good partnership, and try to bring your project to fruition. I think, I think we're showing, showing everyone what we can do. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do, and it's the right thing to do for our people, right? And because it's the right thing to do to mo for Mother Earth. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors across Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. Join us next time for another Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandin Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Partial funding for this episode of Native Report is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.